The video game industry is abundant with contractors and freelancers looking for work. From concept art, to music production, to voice acting, these individuals float from project to project, rarely being tied down to one company exclusively. And unfortunately, the industry is also rife with instances where these contractors are taken advantage of, either by being denied a promised payment for their work, or getting their names scrubbed from the projects they worked on, or by simply being given horrible working conditions with unreasonable deadlines and little resources. As sad as it is, even the well-known and highly respected contractors still get this kind of treatment. And it's not exclusive to the video game industry. They are regularly screwed over in the film and television sector too. Visual effects artists on big blockbusters are crunched so badly they sleep in their offices for days at a time. Voice actors sometimes get as little as $150 for the entirety of their work on popular franchises. Sadly, another high-profile victim of this poor treatment of freelancers has now arisen, and it starts a few years back. On May 4th, 2020, Marty Stratton, the studio director of id Software, as well as the executive producer of Doom Eternal, made a post on the Doom subreddit, titled, Doom Eternal OST Open Letter. This open letter was in response to an ongoing discussion among the community regarding the state of the game's original soundtrack, which many had deemed to be a noticeable step down in quality due to the fact that the composer for the soundtrack, Mick Gordon, who also composed the score for Doom 2016, was able to edit and mix only 12 of the 59 existing tracks, and the remainder had to be completed by the studio's own lead audio designer, Chad Mossholder. Marty's post is fairly long, but the gist of it is that he was attempting to dispel any rumors that it was id Software who was at fault by not giving Mick enough time or freedom to deliver on his end of the agreement. Marty states that he was surprised by Mick doubting they would ever work again, and that Mick had near limitless creative autonomy on the project. He asserts that Mick's failure to deliver the final product was entirely his own fault, especially considering that id even gave him a six-week deadline extension. Marty says that as the deadline drew closer, it was Mick himself who suggested that his and Chad's work be combined into a more comprehensive release, and that Chad's work could be fleshed out more if a heavier sound was needed. Marty then says that even though Mick signed off on all this, he ended up being publicly disapproving of how the soundtrack was handled. Basically, Marty spends the entire post painting Mick as the one who was unprofessional, unreliable, and two-faced. But was it true? Unfortunately, Mick never really released a direct response, and a fair amount of people took Marty's word at face value. It was pretty easy to do because an executive going out of their way to directly speak to the fans on a fan-run forum seemed like a gesture of goodwill especially when it directly addressed the frustration surrounding the release of the anticipated soundtrack. So a sizable chunk of the community went forward under the impression that it was Mick Gordon who burned the bridge between himself and id Software. Until November 9th, 2022, two and a half years after Marty's post, Mick Gordon finally broke his silence. Hosted on Medium and announced through Twitter, he dropped a nuke of a reply a very lengthy tell-all article that featured a ton of receipts, including screenshots of emails that Mick actually sent. And when I say lengthy, I mean lengthy. I can't really even bother to read it all to you word by word in this video unless I wanted the video to be an hour and a half long or more. I did a quick and dirty word count by copying and pasting the whole thing into a word processor and apparently it's damn near 15,000 in length, about six times longer than Marty Stratton's open letter published on r slash doom. I do recommend reading it yourself if you have the time and patience for it, but for now, I will go over all the key points in the same order as the article presents them. Right off the bat, Mick states that id handed him a schedule that required him to score two levels per month, which he says is a tight deadline but not impossible. But the real problem was how quickly this schedule became disconnected with the actual development pipeline of the game. Because the game was still two years away from release, and little to no gameplay was finished, 
Mick basically had to score the game using scant information about the combat, pace, and world, and his own imagination. Mick suggested a pretty reasonable solution to these problems. Focus on a general musical identity for the game before going into specific themes, and eliminate the two levels per month requirement for more flexibility. Seemed pretty easy, but Marty struck it down. And Mick says he struck it down quite rudely and aggressively. Thus, Mick had to press on with guesswork, a lot of which ended up not fitting the game as it progressed in development, so more and more of his work had to be thrown out as the weeks passed. And it became clear that whoever decided on the music budget also did not understand or anticipate the actual scope of the game. Mick had to crunch more and more as the deadline drew closer, and any attempts at communicating with id ended in failure. He was left out of meetings, his emails and calls were ignored, and calls with the audio team were taken over by managers who were in a panic. But it only gets worse from there. id Software attempted to deny Mick any payment for his work as often as they could, under the notion that they just didn't like what he was making. At one point, Mick went 11 straight months without being paid for any of the work he had done in that time, beginning in January 2019. And on top of that, his crunching was so bad, he would spend days at a time at his studio, away from family, living off of microwaved food. And still, it gets worse. On June 6, 2019, at Bethesda's E3 presentation, Doom Eternal was given its initial release date of November 22nd of that same year. And with that announcement was the reveal of a collector's edition that included a copy of Mick Gordon's original Doom Eternal soundtrack. This was a problem because he had been working only on in-game music, so this soundtrack did not yet exist and was nowhere close to even beginning to exist. And as the cherry on top, this live presentation was the first time Mick was hearing about the existence of this OST. Mick was willing to produce this OST, but needed a contract in order to do so, but Marty apparently refused to draw one up. This put Mick in a tough position because even though he wasn't in a spot to facilitate the creation of this OST, his name was already tied to it, and the public would blame him if this OST was never released. Time pressed on, and Mick continued to work in spite of being ignored and exhausted. He says he contemplated quitting, but found himself believing that he would lose more by quitting now than he would gain if he finished the project. The game was inevitably delayed to March 2020, and while this might have seemed like a potential blessing for Mick, it only led him to being strung along even more. He had finally become fed up enough to threaten to leave the project after 10 months of no pay, but had to play ball because he couldn't afford a legal battle against Zenimax. Finally, he received his pay at the end of November 2019, which meant his contract had been fulfilled and his role in the project had ended. The in-game music was finished, but of course this was after two straight years of rigid schedules, constant crunching, producing guesswork that got thrown out, and little to no communication from id. In spite of everything, Mick held fast and stayed with the project until the end, and the game would launch to critical acclaim and financial success. However, the problems still didn't go away. Mick soon noticed that all of the music he produced during the project, nearly five hours worth, was being used in the game, but he was only paid for half of it. This was a tough spot, because placement of that music within the game was the job of the lead audio designer, Chad. And once Mick sends the files over, it was the audio team's job to decide what they would do with them. This extra two and a half hours of music contained rejected tracks, mock-ups, and demos that Mick was under the impression would end up not being used, but were eventually put in the game and in marketing material anyway and id Software did not pay him for it. Mick wanted to begin work on the OST, but Marty continued to ignore his requests for a new contract to be written up, forcing him to skip over id entirely and talk to Bethesda instead. This opened up another can of worms because apparently, Mick was still owed money from a totally separate OST he made for Bethesda back in 2015, 
which I assume is Wolfenstein. And Bethesda used this fact to their advantage in this new contract for Doom Eternal's OST by saying that payment for that other OST would be consolidated into this new contract. So now, Nick had to go along with it in order to get his rightfully owed pay for two OSTs. So negotiations for the Doom Eternal OST began, and Mick proposed 30 tracks totaling at over 2 hours in length, comparable to Doom 2016's OST. This was shot down immediately because it was clear there wasn't enough time or money to cover a project of that size. But Marty claimed in the open letter that this suggestion was agreed upon, wording it in a way that made him seem generous by allowing Mick an extension. That was a total lie. Thus, Bethesda wrote up a draft for the contract. It stated that Mick had to produce 12 tracks for the OST, that id Software had final approval for the track list, that the contract would include payment for the 2015 OST he was owed money for, and that the deadline for Doom Eternal's OST was April 16th, but was flexible if need be. This seems all well and good until March 11th came around and a delay for the OST was announced, because Mick STILL had not received the final draft for this contract. Work for the OST began, but suddenly, Marty sent a frantic email stating that the April 16th deadline was now a necessity, because consumer protection laws in certain territories meant consumers who pre-ordered the collector's edition were entitled to a full refund if the OST was not out by April 20th. Mick realized this was a threat and that he would be held legally liable if the OST was late. He says that if he knew of these consumer protection laws, he would never have agreed to do the OST at all. But Marty had a backup plan, and it did not involve Mick. Marty said that he already had the lead audio designer, Chad, make a quick and dirty alternative OST by cutting and editing together snippets of the in-game score. And creation of this alternative OST began six months prior, meaning that Marty was secretly working against Mick the entire time. Marty claimed in his open letter that bringing in Chad was a last minute decision basically as a safety net but the very metadata within the files that Chad sent Mick suggest that creation of this other OST began all the way back in August 2019. The deadline was close and Mick had to face reality. It was no longer feasible to create a good product anymore, because Chad's slapdash edits were not OST quality, and it was obvious fans would notice. Now, Mick had to focus on preparing for potential repercussions. Mick focused on fulfilling his contract, 12 tracks for the remaining 8 days. Again, he crunched 18 to 20 hour days and slept beneath his desk at the studio. With literally a few hours remaining, Mick sends 10 songs over, and Marty interfered, suddenly explaining that he did not want these 10 songs, but different ones instead. He had been uncooperative and absent this entire time, and now, at the last moment, he wants to give direction. Marty vetoed Mick's OST and said they would go with Chad's version. Mick couldn't do anything about it as he's merely a contractor. Mick confirmed with id that he had met his contractual obligations, and probably the only silver lining in this tale finally happens. He was paid the full contract amount plus an on-time bonus without dispute. Mick was never allowed to listen to the OST before it was released. But when it was, he eventually had the time, and lo and behold, it was awful. It was full of shoddy edits, poor synchronization, technical mistakes, timing errors, the works. To say that it was a quick and dirty hack job would be kind. What was extra frustrating to Mick was seeing Chad being credited alongside him as co-artist. Chad played no part in actually creating any of this music yet was given the same level of importance as Mick anyway. A particularly bad example is track 59, Final Sin, Sandy City. Mick says that this was a demo file rejected by Chad himself, yet placed in the OST with Chad's name right next to it. <laughs> 
The OST released to harsh reactions from fans, and Mick, despite being screwed over, still felt guilty over its quality. And Marty, in an act of confounding narcissism, emailed Mick to ask why he wasn't giving public support for the OST. Marty insisted he wanted a positive outcome for all involved, but the following Skype call between them had him on a warpath. Marty was jumping to the conclusion that Mick's firmness on this matter was some sort of attack. Mick pointed out that the OST was announced without his involvement and that he was not told of the looming consumer protection laws until 13 days before the OST was supposed to launch. Marty defended his decision to ignore Mick and keep him in the dark by saying this was some sort of comeuppance for Mick not falling in line, and that as soon as people come after us, we come after you. A pretty brazen threat if there ever was one. This call ended up being an hour of Marty raging and chastising Mick for things the latter had no control over. But it ended with one agreement, that both men would make a joint statement together in order to control the growing inferno of fan frustration. Marty asked Mick to not say anything publicly until the time was right, and Mick complied. However, in an ugly, deceptive, two-faced move, Marty instead went on the Doom subreddit to post that open letter and dump all the blame onto Mick's lap without so much as a heads up. Mick states that the open letter was stuffed to the brim with lies, and that Marty knew enough about Reddit and how the site worked to know that this open letter would be seen by many, many people in a short amount of time. Mick decided that enough was enough, and he finally brought in lawyers who contacted Zenimax directly. Zenimax tried to defend themselves, but Mick countered by plainly stating that Marty's allegations were in fact in direct contradiction with the contract Mick legally completed, and that id Software breached that contract by using twice as much music as they paid for. Zenimax quickly buckled and tried to settle, but the settlement was insulting, to say the least. Zenimax supposedly proposed a deal where they would pay what they owe, and in return, Mick makes a new, polished version of the Doom Eternal OST. Basically, Zenimax acted as if they were generous for offering to pay for music they essentially stole, and having Mick work for them even longer on a project he should have had total control over at the very start. A shocking, disgusting lack of accountability here. Then another settlement was made, in which Mick would receive a six-figure sum, and in exchange, Marty would never have to delete his open letter loaded with lies, and Mick would never be allowed to talk about the OST situation or publicly criticize any Zenimax product. For life. Basically, Zenimax was offering a wad of cash for Mick to take all the blame and reputation damage until his dying day. Again, insulting. Mick was already seeing harassment from fans online who were successfully misled by Marty's open letter, and he decided to offer a final settlement. That Zenimax pay him for the extra music used in Doom Eternal, Marty takes down the open letter, and in exchange, Mick will produce a better OST. It was the most reasonable and fair counteroffer Mick could have made. In fact, it was probably too nice. Anyone with slightly more spite in them would have rather died than offer more work. But this reasonable offer was met with stalling, and the wait for a response dragged on. Then Mick decided to take the open letter situation into his own hands by personally contacting one of the moderators of the subreddit, who thankfully complied with Mick's request to remove the post. But 12 hours later, the post was back up. The mod blocked Mick, and Mick was given a prompt message from Marty's lawyers that Marty was greatly offended by the removal, and that now an amicable resolution was impossible. Again, Marty displays no desire to respond to Mick unless it's an opportunity to make Mick look worse. Marty tries to paint Mick as the one who burned the bridge that could have led to a positive outcome, but we all know now that that bridge never existed to begin with. This put Mick in the position he is in now, making a public response, 
because it's really the only way to get any semblance of closure that doesn't result in him getting screwed over more. He iterates that he generally loves his career and the relationships he's formed and work he's created throughout, and that he never quit Doom. He only quit a toxic client. This is definitely apparent in his consistent willingness to go back and fix the Doom Eternal OST, even after all of this stuff has happened. The next section of Mick's statement is a direct rebuttal of Marty's open letter, bit by bit. It re-emphasizes stuff we've already went over in the main body of the article, but the specific points raised against Marty's words are, one, Doom Eternal's OST was poorly managed from the outset, with Mick not even being contracted for it when it was announced. Two, the OST was delayed before Mick was under contract, and thus, Mick is not to blame for any delays because he technically wasn't yet hired to make it. Three, the deadline for the OST was not in January like Marty states, but rather in March, and Mick was only contracted for 12 songs, not 30 songs which was Mick's suggestion, but was ultimately refused. 4. Mick was paid for fulfilling his contract, so accusations of unprofessionalism on his part would make little sense because it would have been grounds for id, Bethesda, and Zenimax to refuse payment. 5. id Software was already working on an alternative OST for months before Mick was contracted, meaning Marty's claims that Chad was brought on at the last minute are false. 6. Marty doesn't seem to understand the mastering process as he blames the OST's poor quality on Mick instead of Chad, even though id themselves approved all of Mick's in-game scores. 7. The problems with the OST's quality were obvious immediately because Mick was receiving questions about it the moment it released so him clarifying that he did little work on it was not some sort of war declaration on id like Marty pretends it is. 8. Mick stated that he would probably never work with it again because, well, Marty treated him like shit the entire time, which makes Marty pretending to be blindsided by that comment pretty disgusting. Furthermore, Mick adds that he dislikes Chad being credited as an artist not only because he didn't make any of the music, but because id also refused to let Mick credit his own longtime collaborators who actually did contribute to the score. Plus, to this day, Mick has never personally received any award given to Doom Eternal's score. He's only ever seen them behind a glass case from a distance, and Marty himself was enough of a douchebag to collect some of those awards himself. And 9. Mick says the most hurtful lie Marty made was the suggestion that Mick's alleged unprofessionalism led to the harassment of an id employee, even though Chad was brought in by Marty himself without Mick's knowledge, and Marty highlighted Chad's involvement himself in the open letter. <sighs> and that pretty much concludes Mick's statement. There's still some smaller details I didn't go into for the sake of brevity, but I suggest you read the whole thing yourself if you have the time and patience for it. If I read through the whole thing word for word, then this video would probably end up being an hour or so long, which would defeat the purpose of it being a more digestible summary. The situation surrounding the Doom Eternal OST is an extremely complicated one that dates back years. And even though it took two and a half years, Mick Gordon finally gave the full story, and it is damning. It shows that not only was he actually not to blame for the album's poor quality, but the person who first pointed the finger at him publicly, Marty Stratton, is the one responsible not only for the dismal condition of the final product, but also for the heinous mistreatment of Mick himself for pretty much the entire time he was working on the game. Mick was brought on for in-game music without any finished levels to draw inspiration from, requiring a ton of guesswork that was thrown out. He was announced to be making an original soundtrack that he wasn't contracted for yet. He was ignored every single time he tried to communicate with id management. He was forced to crunch 18 to 20 hour days constantly to meet ridiculous deadlines and had to sleep in his studio for days at a time and live off microwaved food. 
he went as long as 11 straight months without being paid for any of the work he did in that time. He went unpaid for an extra two and a half hours worth of music that was used in the game and marketing material even though he was contracted for half of that. He was being secretly ousted as the OST producer by Marty bringing in Chad without any notification. He was straight up libeled by Marty in the open letter on Reddit and every attempt at a settlement was met with a demeaning counteroffer that didn't have any closure to the ordeal. Mick did not take a six-figure sum to keep his mouth shut. He decided to come forward with the truth. After reading everything, it's almost impossible to truly grasp how insanely mistreated Mick was for months on end. It's incredible he waited a whole two and a half years to make a response. Anyone with less patience would have probably tried to make this statement immediately, but I imagine Mick wrote this with the help of legal counsel. This entire story is a freelancer's worst fucking nightmare. Every conceivably realistic worry a music contractor would have about a project came to life during Mick Gordon's time working on Doom Eternal. It's beyond the pale. The horrible planning, the malicious silent treatment, the terrible crunching, the cruel refusal of payment, the shameless character assassination, and the total squandering of creative talent. It's all here. It's almost awe-inspiring with how much rage it can draw out of you. It's completely fucking abhorrent and unacceptable. And it's also totally baffling that Marty would attempt this nonsense with someone as famous and respected as Mick who was able to continue finding work within and without the video game industry even after Marty tried to ruin his reputation. But either way, in this particular circumstance, Mick was just another victim of unnecessary corporate hostility and awful management. The specific thing that pisses me off personally is Marty's unrelenting narcissism throughout this whole thing. It seems he never once bothered to communicate with Mick unless it was an opportunity to ruin his work. Every single attempt Mick made at peacefully remedying this situation was flipped by Marty into a perceived attack. Even though Marty never seemed to speak to Mick in good faith to begin with. It was fucking agonizing for me to read Mick's recollection of Marty blaming him for ruining settlement negotiations by asking Reddit mods to take the libelous open letter down. Marty went out of his way to avoid peace talks, but then proceeded to paint the victim of the situation as a perpetrator when he did the only thing he could feasibly do to save his reputation from false accusations. If there's any single individual who should get blame here, it's Marty Stratton. He is the studio director at id. He had every opportunity to simply not be a piece of shit to Mick. And again, I understand why some people believed his open letter at first. It was an executive going straight to the community to address a controversy. It seemed like a level of transparency that isn't normally given, so it was appreciated and thus taken at face value. But let this be a lesson to us all. Never take an executive's words at face value. I've also seen some fingers pointed over at Chad Mossholder. But I don't see any reason to believe, at least at the moment, that he was acting maliciously against Mick like Marty was. Chad might have just been doing his job. Overall, this whole situation is just a complete shitstorm that was sadly aimed at one man. I hope Mick gets the closure he deserves and he's able to truly go back and polish that Doom Eternal OST on his terms and at his pace. If anything, this whole story serves as a very sobering reminder to everyone that if you are a freelancer who makes your living contract by contract, you could be one bad client away from your entire career falling out from under you. This concludes my summary and thoughts on the matter. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.